So we're going to start with our third keynote speaker, Malika Ouvray from um, the Institute for Intelligence Systems and Robotics in Paris. Um, her research focuses on uh, multisensory processes, how they shape uh, the perception of the world and self. And her talk is titled Hearing Tactile Interactions, Visualiz Visualizing Sounds, Touching Distances, Current Directions in Sensory Conversion Research. So I'll hand over to you. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you for the introduction. Is it working, the, the microphone? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, so, first, our perceptual reality, in fact. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Like this? Oh, okay. So, um, our perceptual reality corresponds to a very thin slice of the real. And for instance, we perceive an extremely small proportion of the electromagnetic spectrum. We see the visible light because we have specialized receptors to perceive at this wavelength. Meanwhile, we remain unaware of many other waves that are passing through us at the moment. And this because we do not have the correct photoreceptors to do so. Other species have access to other portions of reality. For instance, snakes have receptors to detect infrared signals. Honeybees have receptors to detect ultraviolet light. In principle, if we were to have the appropriate receptors, we could have access to far more information in the visual modality and the, in the other sensory modality. We could even have access to non-sensory information. What if we could see infrared or ultraviolet? What if we had a sense of the north or were able to read our Twitter posts through touch? Sensory conversion consists in providing information through an atypical sensory channel. In the case of sensory augmentation, this is done to allow new perception. In sensory substitution, this is done to compensate the loss of one sense by feeding its information through other channels. Among all these possibilities, okay, among... Is it better? Okay. <laughs> so among all these possibilities, I will focus on these three questions. Can people see through sounds or tactile stimuli? Can social touch be transmitted through audition? <laughs> and what is the nature of the experience with sensory substitution? So first question, can people see through touch or tactile stimuli? So sensory substitution devices were developed at first to compensate for the loss of one sensory modality by means of another sensory modality. To compensate for vision, Two main categories of devices were developed, visual to tactile devices that convert visual images into tactile stimuli, and visual to auditory devices that convert visual images into sound. So for visual to tactile devices, it works as follows. You have a sensor, here a camera on the head, uh, that scans the external world. Then each image goes through a conversion device, and is transmitted to the uh, observer through tactile vibrations. In most of the visual to tactile devices, the code is analogical, meaning, for example, that if you see a cross, you will feel a cross on your body. And you have here on your left, the very first version of a tactile device, the TVSS developed by Bakiritas in the 60s, with the vibrators mounted on the back of a dentist's chair. In the middle, a more modern version, and on uh, the right, the actual development of the tongue display unit. And here you can see uh, <laughs> uh, me, obviously. <laughs> um, okay. Here you can see different resolution of an image. So you can see the 60 by 60 resolution, 25 by 25 and 10 by 10. 
And with the 10 by 10, you could have the impression that you won't be able to recognize the image. However, the perceptual process does not consist in analyzing each incoming image, but is an extended process through time that allows you to integrate several points of view on the image. And most of the time, it's the 10 by 10 resolution that is used and that lead to interesting performance. Now I turn to visual to auditory devices that convert visual images into sounds. And I will focus on the voice. So I'm gonna ask you to try and pay attention because we'll find this device uh, across many studies that I will present. So here, um, the device films the external world. Then uh, each image is converted into a grayscale image. And then the image is um, scanned from left to right. So the beginning of the sound corresponds to the left part of the image and the end of the sound to the right part. The vertical position is converted into frequency. The higher the pixel, the higher the frequency. And um, audit visual brightness is translated into auditory loudness. So I hope it will work. So for example, if you have a small line, okay, you hear a short beep. If you have two lines, then you hear two short beeps. If you have an ascending line, then you will hear a sound ascending in pitch. And a descending line will have a sound descending in pitch. Okay, so now I'm going to consider that you're expert with the voice. And I will show you some sounds. And you will have to guess, or try and guess, what is the capital letter behind the sound. So I'm going to start with a simple one. So I guess you, a lot of you had a V. So a more complex one. So this is an M. <laughs> so now. Yes. <laughs> In a difficult one. H. Hey, good. <laughs> okay. Um, so now one of the questions we can ask is what is the nature of the perception with sensory substitution devices? And two main views have been put forward. The dominant stasis, according to which perception remains in the substituting modality, meaning that it remains auditory with the voice or tactile with the TVSS, and the deference thesis, according to which perception goes to the substituted modality, visual in both cases. And from the beginning until now, the visual model dominated the psychological literature. From the first uh, articles wrote by Bakirita, the one that invented the TVSS in the dentist chair and later refinement, he spoke about seeing with the skin or seeing with the brain. And the same goes uh, in the press and in philosophy. So for instance, in the New Scientist, they spoke of a sensory hijack, rewiring brains to see with sound. Even in philosophy, it reoccurs over and over again. So for example, Hill, who was a philosopher and a blind person and who used the TVSS for long, said that the person making intelligent use of a TVSS may be said to be seeing features of his environment. Okay, so to summarize, we have images that are converted into tactile stimuli or sounds. Then we have perceptual and cognitive processes that lead to functional abilities, brain plasticity, and an associated phenomenology. And I'm going to detail each of these three points. So regarding functional abilities, many studies were conducted. And I can uh, give the example on, of a study we did a very long time ago with the voice. So here we trained uh, blindfolded sighted participants with the voice during 15 hours. And after two or three hours, participants were able to do displacement and pointing tasks. And after five more hours, they were able to recognize 10 objects complex objects of everyday use and to categorize them. 
and this in less than a minute and for some in uh, 20 seconds. And I even have a colleague, Amir Amedi, in Israel, who massively trained uh, blind participants over 50 hours. And then um, one person even managed to uh, recognize different faces. So I can show you a very short uh, video. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, but, uh, I can I cannot share it. It's the only video, so don't do it. Yeah, no, I'll show you. You'll trust me on my words. <laughs> Then we have plenty of studies that were conducted showing um, with visual to tactile devices abilities in localization tasks, simple form recognition and reading, and with visual to auditory devices abilities in object localization, navigation tasks, form recognition, complex shapes and natural image recognition, texture recognition, and even in some cases overlapping shapes. And Laurent René even showed uh, a sensitivity to visual illusion. Regarding brain activations, several studies interestingly showed an activation in the visual cortex after practice with visual to auditory devices and with visual to tactile devices, meaning that having only access, for example, to the sound of the voice after training, this lead to an increased activation in the visual cortex. And this has been massively used to say that the corresponding perception is visual. However, uh, Ron Cooper and Maurice Tito raised uh, a point saying that maybe a same brain area have different functions in the blind and in the sighted. So what did they do to show that? They applied TMS on the visual cortex both before and after a long practice with the tongue display unit, the one with the tactile vibrators on the tongue. And uh, what the TMS does at a certain frequency, it reenacts the corresponding function. So before training, nothing happens. After training, correlating with an increased activation in V1, some of the participants reported tactile sensations that they referred to the tongue. So according to the authors, the subjective experience associated with an activity in the visual cortex after this sensory remapping can be tactile and not visual. In addition, uh, in Amelie's lab, it was shown activation beyond primary sensory areas. Now regarding associated phenomenology, we have two aspects, the question of emotions and the question of the sensory modality. So regarding emotions, we have very, very scarce data so far. Um, the two same uh, examples reappear in the literature. One from a blind man who says that after long practice with the TVSS, he's able to recognize his wife through the device, but there's no emotion associated to the recognition. And also the example of two blind students who said that they are able to recognize naked woman in magazines, but without any associated emotion. Uh, so it appears that the shapes perceived in one sensory modality are not directly associated to pleasures or pain felt while perceiving the same shape in another sensory modality. However, uh, I think that this should not be surprising. Um, emotions are not something that is out there that we just need to pick up as a basic uh, information processing. So one element to say that it might be not be due to the device itself is that similar reports of a lack of emotion were done by persons blind from birth who recover sight by a removal of cataracts. So according to some of these persons uh, that are reported in the article quoted here, there are no affective qualities associated to colors and seeing faces is not associated to any emotional content. So there are two aspects to uh, better understand how emotions could arise. The first one is to link emotion with learning. So maybe the emotions could arise with the longer or earlier use of the device. 
and attempts for this were done by uh, Eliana Sampaio and Bakirita, who equipped babies with the TVSS, here with the vibrators on the pacifier and the camera on the phone. And um, they had some interesting results. And the second would be to link emotions and intersubjectivity. And the idea is that the existence of a community of users might favor the constitution of common values associated to the perception. Now, regarding the question of the modality, in the experiment with the voice we did long ago that I showed you, we also asked after each of the tasks, the pointing tasks and the recognition task, to what sensory modality uh, participants experience resemble more. And it appears that uh, experience was not necessarily associated with a visual experience, nor with an auditory experience. And it appeared to be task dependent. So localization tasks appear to be either akin to vision or another sense, and recognition and categorization tasks appear to be more auditory. So I'm gonna show more data in the next experiment. So the next experiment, the design might be a bit complex. So here again, we used the voice and uh, I wanted to show that using the voice involves both the visual and the auditory modality. So here um, we collected data at the phenomenological level through questionnaires and also at the behavioral level. And the idea was to probe the question, does the auditory experience automatically trigger visual imagery? And to do this, we used a variant of the Stroop task. So I apologize if it's trivial, but um, the Stroop task uses two conflicting processes. So here, naming a color and reading a word. So if I ask you on the top, what is the color uh, of the word written in blue, you're going to easily say it's blue. Now on the line below, if I ask you to name the color yellow of the first word, you're going to be fast slower. And this because reading is automatized. So it interferes with the naming of the color. So we did the same with uh, the voice. So we trained participants with the voice during three hours. And during training, uh, the participants were blindfolded. And then before and after training, we did an interference task, a troop light task. So here, the participants just listened to sounds. The sounds could be four different sounds that each corresponded to the conversion of a visual line. So they could hear these four sounds. And they just had to say, is it the first, the second, the third, or the fourth that we trained them to, to, to understand. And at the se so the task is only auditory. And while they are doing the auditory task, we present them visual distractors. So visual lines, visually. Here, the participants are no longer blindfolded. And these visual lines could be either similar to the sound or different. And the hypothesis is that if there's no visual imagery recruited, then uh, an incongruent distractor should not impair their performance. So to summarize, we had a training with the voice for three hours. The participants uh, did object identification, localization, and orientation discrimination. Um, we had two groups, 16 participants that did the training and 16 others without any training. And before and after they did the cross-modal interference task that I just showed you. We also gathered uh, phenomenological questionnaires after each of the tasks. And finally, the participants completed auditory tests at the beginning and at the end. So the results uh, concerning the visual interference effect um, yeah, I don't have a pointer, but that's okay. So first we can see in blue that before training, participants' performance were the same when the visual distractor was the same as the auditory target or different. 
And after training, we had an interference effect, meaning that performance, uh, participants' performance were lower in case of an incongruent target. In the control group, performance remained the same, whatever uh, the distractor. Uh, regarding the phenomenological results, so here um, the participants had to rate on a five-point Likert scale uh, if their experience resembled each of the sensory modality and also a sonar-like experience. So first we can see that individual phenomenology is not unisensory. Several sensory modalities or other experiences are ranked high. So for example, you can have uh, an impression that it's highly auditory, uh, 4.5, but also visual at 3. In addition, um, the phenomenology varied with auditory abilities. It remained similar for the participants that had low performance in the auditory tests. And for participants that had high performance in the auditory tests, um, the experience appeared to be visual for the identification task and sonar-like for the localization task. Another behavioral uh, data that we gathered, we saw that performance during the training phase is influenced by auditory abilities. So the better the auditory abilities, the better the performance with the device. So to summarize the results that we obtained, uh, we showed that training with a sensory substitution device induces functional plasticity. The visual interference effect obtained during the auditory task suggests that trained people spontaneously evoke visual images when processing sounds from the device. Both performance during training with the device and individual phenomenology depend on low-level auditory capacities. And finally, uh, these results are in favor of the multisensory hypothesis, meaning that processes with a visual to auditory device find roots both in the visual and in the auditory modalities. So we are now conducting additional research, first to verify if there's an auditory interference effect on visual stimuli, and if there is an influence of visual abilities on performance and phenomenology. So to wrap up this first part, I said that um, we had functional abilities and we saw that participants managed to accomplish a broad range of, uh, of tasks, localization from recognition, generalization, and there is a visual imagery while completing these tasks. There is a brain plasticity, an activation in V1 that might not prove that it is visual, and an activation beyond primary sensory areas. And for the phenomenology, it appears to be multisensory, and we have very scarce data on emotions. We might have more on the second part that I'll now present. Uh, so the second question I've raised is, can social touch be transmitted through audition? So what I can say is that, um, as we can increasingly see, Technology has allowed uh, social interactions at a distance, uh, but this has been done at the expense of touch, as no technology so far allows reproducing social touch. However, the lack of social touch has detrimental consequences on our well-being, as it has been shown to induce higher levels of stress, increasing feelings of loneliness and isolation, and a greater need for social support. So considering this, we tried and find ways to provide access to social information when it is not physically available. So we approached it through two questions. Can we measure objectively social touch? And can we give access to social touch at a distance? And it is very difficult to measure social touch objectively at the subjective level, of course, we can ask questions about pleasantness or intensity, but at an, at an objective level, it is uh, not possible to uh, interpose a surface between the interacting schemes. So what we did, we uh, took advantage on a method based on the vibrations created during tactile interaction. So former studies using physical objects 
showed that if you use an accelerometer and record the signal, the pattern of vibrations are very different as a function of your gesture. So for example, stroking versus tapping a cork, a cork will produce very different vibration. And we can even hear it. It appears pretty obvious. So we used this method for social interactions. So here, um, we equipped uh, our participants with an accelerometer, and we measured through different touches the pattern of vibrations that this produces. So in a first experiment, we asked our participants to touch themselves and someone else, either gently or firmly. And our results showed that the measure is sensitive to differences in applied pressure. However, there was no effect of touching oneself versus touching someone else. Uh, in a second experiment, we asked our participants to do stroking, like caress, either on their own forearm or on someone else's forearm. And this at three speeds, slow, three centimeters per second, medium, nine centimeters per second, and fast, 18 centimeters per second. And again, uh, our results shows that the measure is sensitive to differences in speed, again, without an effect of touching oneself versus someone else. So here we have a technique that is sensitive to parameters of skin-to-skin -skin touch, pressure, and speed. And this technique provides a signal containing information about the behavior of the toucher and the nature of the interaction. Overall, uh, we found no clear differences between touching one's own skin and someone else's skin. And this might suggest the existence of a robust motor invariant insensitive to the target of touch. And finally, this method can be generalized to a broad variety of skin-to-skin -skin characteristics. So now I turn to the second question. Can we give access to these skin-to-skin -skin interactions at a distance? So here, uh, we again build on the idea that there are sensory correspondences between tactile movements and auditory signals, as both modalities express information through vibrations. So we equipped uh, our participants uh, with a violin microphone. In fact, uh, in pilot experiments, we used the two techniques, the violin microphone and the accelerometers, and both uh, led to comparable results. And we recorded uh, several touches. You can see on the right, for example, rub, tap, hit, and stroke. And you can see that the vibratory signal is different. Now the question is, which uh, social touch should we record? And to choose our set of signals, we built on the work by McIntyre and colleagues to which we have added uh, data from Erstenstein and colleagues. So according to all these authors, there's an intuitive and yet quantifiable language of social touch. So in their experiment, they asked their participants to, um, to, to provide different intentional uh, emotions to someone else. And the way uh, they recorded the interaction allows characterizing the different emotions and intention. Um, so they asked several of them, attention, love, happiness, calming, sadness, and gratitude. And we can see, for example, that calming is characterized by a stroking of the wall hand. Happiness is characterized by tapping with multiple fingers. So for our experiments, we had two requirements. First, we wanted the physical properties of tactile gestures that allow specific social emotional intentions to be recognized above chance level in the tactile modality, which is the case for all the emotions reported here. But we also wanted it to be picked up in the auditory modality as well. So for example, a grip cannot be heard auditorily. So that's how we, we chose our data set. 
So here, uh, we conducted two experiments. So in experiment one, we had four different gestures, stroking, rubbing, tapping, and hitting. So here is uh, an example of how we recorded stroking and the corresponding sound. For the second experiment, we recorded six social touch emotions as they were defined uh, by McIntyre and Erstenstein. Uh, here is an example of how we recorded joy and the corresponding sound. Okay, so we had two experiments. Um, we had 50 participants per experiment and they completed several blocks. So in the first, so each time they are presented with the sounds multiple times. In the first block, they provided free text responses without any information or context about the nature of the sound. In the second block, they provided free text responses knowing that sounds correspond to skin to skin touch. In the third block, they did the fourth choice categorization. And in the final block, they rated the balance of the sounds on, on a scale. So first experiment with the four gestures. Uh, I haven't reported here the results from the first block when they knew nothing. Uh, however, one interesting result is that more than 56% uh, of the cases, the sound were correctly uh, understood as belonging to the touch category. So in the second block, they knew that the sound corresponds to a skin-to-skin -skin touch, however, without being probed any of the category. And on the left, you see a word cloud representation of uh, what the participants answered. And you see that they correctly identified most of the tactile gestures, tapping, hit, rubbing, and caress. And in the middle, you can see that they recognized each of the tactile gestures correctly, above 67% of the cases. In the third block uh, presented on the right, here the participants did a first choice categorization task. So they are presented with the sound and they have four answers, the four possible sounds. And here performance increased with a more than 86% uh, percent of correct recognition, uh, ranging up to 96. So here we can say that there is a high recognition of the type of tactile gesture through sounds. Now I turn to the second uh, experiment in which we showed the participants different intentional emotions through sounds. So the sounds corresponding to anger, attention, fear, joy, love, and sympathy. And in the second block, we asked with free text, what emotion does this sound evoke to you? Again, you can see that some of the emotions were correctly recognized, even without knowing which were the emotions. So anger uh, appeared often, attention seeking for attention as well. The fear stimulus was often seen as stress. The sympathy stimulus as tenderness or confronting. Um, and finally, the joy stimulus as intentions, joy or music. So on the right, you can see that the correct identification range from uh, 26, 22 percent to more than 38. So there's a good recognition of the emotions. And in the third block, while doing um, the fourth choice task, here the performance again increased uh, with a correct recognition in many cases. So for example, anger, 54 percent, and so on. Um, there was a confusion between love and sympathy, but that might be explained by the fact that we didn't provide definitions of the emotions and uh, of the emotions. And on the right, you, you can see how the sounds were rated, how the balance of the sound uh, were rated. And interestingly, it corresponds to the balance of the corresponding touch. So the sound corresponding to anger, attention, and fear were ranked low and the sounds corresponding to joy, love, and sympathy were ranked uh, very high. So here we can see a good recognition of the underlying emotions and their associated balance. 
So to summarize, there's a high recognition of the type of tactile gestures, a good recognition of the emotions underlying tactile interactions, as well as their balance. So with our audio touch stimuli, we found meaningful sensory correspondences between audition and touch at the perceptual level, which can even bear affective content, such as basic and pro-social emotions, opening the way to a new form of functional and affective compensation. So what we do now is we try and investigate how close to, to real skin-to-skin -to -skin touch our audio touch stimuli can be, and this at the physiological level, at the neural level, and at the phenomenological level. And at the same time, we see what it can bring in several situations in which you have distant communication. And to do so, um, we conduct studies with Catherine Pelacho, a colleague uh, at EASIER, and we connect our social touch signal while interacting with embodied conversational agents, the platform Greta that she developed uh, in our lab. I hope you're not too tired, the final, uh, the final question. Uh, the question of the nature of the experience with sensory substitution. What do I have? Perfect. So what is the nature of the perception with uh, sensory substitution devices? Several authors proposed that perception with a sensory substitution device is a form of artificially induced synesthesia. And it's something that I'm going to rule out uh, rapidly because I will focus on other points. Um, so what is synesthesia? And, and it was taken after by many other persons that even considered it uh, as a plausible explanation as well. So I've uh, quoted all of them. So synesthesia, uh, in synesthesia, sensory experiences such as tests or concepts such as numbers automatically evoke additional percepts such as colors. So for example, a grapheme color synesthet can experience colors when reading a digit or a letter or lexical gustatory synesthetes can experience tests when hearing or reading certain words. And there are four main characteristics about synesthesia. The fact that it is characterized by the existence of an inducer concurrent pairing, both consciously perceived at the same time. Second, synesthesia is relatively idiosyncratic. So, for example, two graphene color synesthetes won't associate the same color to one digit. So, for example, for one person, an A is red and for another, an A is pink. Synesthesia is automatic. So, the concurrent is experienced uh, involuntarily and automatically. And synesthesia is consistent. The same inducer always triggers the same concurrent. And what I'm going to say is that perception with sensory substitution devices do not fit these four criteria. So regarding first uh, the inducer concurrent pairing, if we take uh, developmental synesthesia, the definition is that both the inducer, let's say the sound here, and the concurrent, the color, are perceived at the same time. So the synesthesia view of sensory substitution in the second row says the same, we perceive both, let's say, the sound of the voice and a corresponding color. However, this doesn't fit any of the data found with sensory substitution devices, nor the theories behind. According to the dominance view, you have only access to the sound. According to the difference view, you have only access to the visual information while the sound recedes to the background. And according to the multi-sensory view that I defended, you have a mixture of both. So in none of these cases, you have both the inducer and the concurrent at the same time. And if we look rapidly at the other criteria, similarly, whether you take um, as the second component of the pairing, the perceptual experience, what people report, or the substituted information, let's say vision for the voice, you never have the fourth criteria. So if I go back to the dominance versus, so I ruled out synesthesia. Now, if I go back to the dominance versus difference debate, 
the same goes. Uh, none of the data that I showed were in favor either of the dominant stasis nor of the different stasis. Again, to summarize what we did rapidly, you have a lot of criteria to define and categorize the sensory modalities. So different authors um, debated uh, about which is the correct criteria, but whatever uh, the, the set you choose, if you take what really happens with sensory substitution, uh, the, the data doesn't fit one of the two views. So as we saw with brain activation, you have an increased activation in V1, but that, not, that does not necessarily correspond to a visual experience. With behaviors, you have many functional data, but then uh, the question becomes a matter of degree associated with performance. With qualitative experience, we saw that it is rather multisensory. Um, for the stimulus properties and dedication, we didn't see them, but, uh, but um, the, the same goes. I did lot it uh, more extensively in several um, papers. Other aspects is that the dominance versus difference view, which I termed the perceptual assumption, overlooks important features of use of sensory substitution devices and integration. First, the fact that the integration is limited and it is a cognitively demanding activity. The fact that training built on pre-existing cognitive skills and that there are activation beyond primary sensory areas. This also might explain the limited success of these devices among the blind person. And indeed, there are important differences between hopes and messages the scientific community sends to blind person. You're going to see through the skin, you're going to see through the ears and so on. Whereas if we would have been more honest, saying that you can have access to additional functions, specialized functions, then I think the reception would have been far better. So an alternative model might include a transformative aspect of sensory substitution devices beyond pre-existing capacities and skills that are half cognitive, half perceptual. So the idea here is that using these devices is not equivalent to perception in an already existing sensory modality. And it's uh, an idea that I developed with Eric Main and then with other colleagues, Gabriel Arnold and Jacques Pimelorosso. So the idea is that these devices transform and extend our perceptual capacities and hence should be seen as tools giving rise to a novel form of interaction with the environment. And here we can draw a parallel with mind enhancing tools, which provide means of expanding cognition. And for these enhancing tools, such as computers or calculators, there are two ways of seeing them. A conservative view, um, leading to the idea that these tools just allow you to facilitate things that you can already do. So you know how to compute and a calculator just will allow you to do this more rapidly. And there is a transformative view of mind enhancing tools so the idea is that novel tools not only facilitate established cognitive processes, but they allow for the appearance of novel cognitive operations, which would have been impossible without them. So without the proper means to write down, calculate, or draw diagrams, the human cognitive abilities would not have evolved to their current state. And the same applies to sensory substitution devices, and I think to any augmentation device, they provide novel forms of interaction with the environment, which cannot be reduced to perception in one of the natural senses. So the idea is that of the vertical integration uh, hypothesis, the idea that perception with these devices is vertically integrated and involves both the substituted and the substituting modality, with the voice, it involves both uh, visual and auditory abilities. So it is a multisensory experience that is based on pre-existing capacities and that is fed by perceptual and cognitive strategies. And this is reflected by the fact that we have many individual differences as a function of these abilities. 
So for example, with the voice, people with good musical abilities and people with good auditory abilities are better with the device. So some uh, concluding remarks. Um, as we saw, sensory substitution uh, questions the organization of the brain, at least the definition of the sensory modalities. The organization might be more task specific rather uh, and, and rather sensory independent. These devices raise hope for sensorially impaired persons. So for the device that we saw, visual to tactile and visual to auditory conversion systems for the blind, but uh, we can also have tactile vest with tactile vibrators for the depths or the brain port for people with proprioceptive and balance impairment. And finally, conversion systems opened endless possibilities to extend our perceptions and experiences and hence to extend our world. So to conclude, I want to thank uh, my collaborators so in the top row, all uh, the PhD and postdoc students uh, that I had or have in my team, as well as external collaborators. And I thank you for your attention.